The Boy Scouts' Invasion That was a grand surprise that the Boy Scouts of Spring Lake Academy put over on the Camp Fire Girls of Hiawatha Institute. They had been planning it for several weeks, or since they first received information of the Grand Council Fire as a closing event of the first semester of the girls' school. The two institutions were located in municipalities only 15 miles apart, connected by both steam railroad and electric interurban lines. Spring Lake Academy located on a lake of the same name at the southern outskirt of Kingston, was originally a boys' military school, and it still retained that primal distinction. But the success of Hiawatha Institute as a Camp Fire Girls school set the imaginative minds of some of the leaders of the boys at Spring Lake to work along similar lines, with the result that the faculty's cooperation was petitioned for the organisation of the student body into a troop of Boy Scout patrols. The scheme was successful and as it served to inject new life into the academy, the business end of the institution had no ground for complaint. This innovation at Spring Lake was due largely to the activities of Clifford Long one of the students. He was a cousin of Marion Stanlock, and naturally this relationship served to direct his personal interest toward Hiawatha Institute. Not a few other students in these two schools were similarly related, some of them being brothers and sisters. And so it was not to be wondered at if these two places of learning became, as it were, twin schools, with much of interest in common and many of their activities interassociated. They had rival debating teams between which were held more or less periodic contests, and in the numerous social events there were frequently exchanges of invitational courtesies. The boys plotted their big surprise on the girls in true scout fashion. There was no real secret in the fact that the Campfire Girls of Hiawatha Institute were planning a big event, but girl-like they affected secrecy to stimulate interest. The result was more than could have been expected, although the girls did not realise this until after it was all over. The curiosity of the Spring Lake boys was thoroughly alive as soon as they learned of a mysterious something big going on at the Institute. True to the character of real scouts, they delegated emissaries, commonly denominated spies, to visit the stronghold of the Campfire Girls, get all the details of their plans discoverable and report back to headquarters. Greater success than that which rewarded their efforts could hardly have been wished for. Half a dozen boys went and returned and then put their heads and their reports together with the result that the scouts of the school had all the information they needed. They mapped out their plans and scheduled their prospective movements by the calendar and the clock. They chartered an interurban train for the run to and from the Institute. The arrival on the scene of the Grand Council Fire was, as we have seen, a complete surprise to the girls. The scouts well knew that their presence would not be regarded as an intrusion, for a Grand Council Fire, according to the handbook, is for friends and the public. The interruption of the program by the marching of the Boy Scouts within the circle of the Campfire Girls was permitted to continue for 10 or 15 minutes, while a number of short speeches were made by some of the boy leaders, in which they gloried over the way they had put one over the girls, and were not 
through yet, announced Harry Gilbert prophetically. Some of us are going to put over another surprise just about as thrilling as this, and we want to challenge you to find out what it is. Of course, this statement produced the very result the boys desired. Naturally, they wished the girls to think they were pretty bright fellows. They got just what they were looking for as a result of their surprise, namely, volumes of praise. To be sure, this did not come in the form of undisguised admiration. That isn't the way a clever girl signifies her approval of this sort of thing. It just burst into evidence through such mock jeers as, You boys think you are so smart, or It's a wonder you wouldn't have gone to enough pains to build a railroad or sink a submarine. To which, on one occasion in the course of the evening, Earl Hamilton replied, Thank you, ladies. We always do things thorough. Lee, screamed Catherine Crane. Yes, it was really a scream, and explosion too, if the indelicacy may be excused. But the opportunity for a comeback struck her so keenly, so swiftly, that she just could not contain her eagerness to beat somebody else to it. Well, the laugh that followed also was of the nature of an explosion, and it was on poor Catherine quite as much as on Earl, who had tripped up on an adjective in place of an adverb. The girl's eagerness was so evident that it struck everybody as funnier than the boy's mistake in grammar. Anyway, she recovered quite smartly and followed up her attack with this pert addendum as the laughter subsided. You evidently don't do your lessons thoroughly. The emphasis on the lee was so pronounced, almost spasmodic as to bring forth another laughing applause. This exchange of repertoire took place in the large school auditorium, to which all repaired as soon as the outdoor exercises had been finished. The program of the evening was punctuated by interruptions of this kind every now and then. Of course, the funny makers waited for suitable opportunities to spring their quips and cranks so that no merited interest in the doing could be lost. And none of it was lost. The presence of the bold invaders seemed to add zest to the most routine of the campfire performances. And when all was over, everybody was agreed that there had not been a dull minute during the whole evening. At the close of the campfire girls' program, the 150 Boy Scouts arose and, with heroic unison of voices peculiar to much practice in the delivery of school yells, they chanted a clever parody of Wo He Lo Cheer, a Boy Scouts compliment to the Camp Fire Girls, and then marched out of the auditorium and away toward the interurban line, where their chartered train was waiting for them and all the while they continued the chant with variations of the words, the rhythmic drive of their voices pulsing back to the Institute, but becoming fainter and more faint until at last the sound was lost with the speeding away of the trolley train in the distance.